When I was a young boy, I was fascinated by this little fellow. He belongs, of course, to a popular children's cartoon series called The Smurfs. And in these stories, he has this extraordinary, mysterious library full of books with secrets and magic in it. Now, when I got a little bit older, I thought, yeah, that is like the Harry Potter libraries. These kind of books just don't exist. Until... I was proven wrong. In this episode, I want to share with you extraordinary books that hold secrets. Welcome back to Bold Books and Bones. When I picked up this book in the local bookstore, I did not know what to expect. It is called The Madman's Library, and the subtitle reads The Strangest Books, Manuscripts, and Other Literary Curiosities from History written by Edward Brooke Hitching. The author is, maybe not surprisingly, the son of an antiquarian book dealer. And in his introduction, he explains in a fascinating way that there are many different forms of writing. This seems at first sight obvious. However, most of the examples that he uses in his book are, to say the least, extraordinary. For example, the author talks about a book secretly written by a man called Petr Moon, a Norwegian journalist. He was a political prisoner during the Nazi occupation of his country. He wrote this text during his captivity on brown toilet paper while living in a small prison cell. The text came about by poking little holes with a small nail in the brown paper to create the characters. He writes about his fears, his torture, how much he misses a woman called Bella, and he started to pray to God, although he was not a believer. Unfortunately, he died at a rather young age during the war. But just before he died, he told a fellow prisoner about his secret writings and where he had hidden them. He had first rolled the pieces of paper that contained his text until they had the shape of small tubes. He numbered them and then pushing them through the holes of the ventilation grill. His hope was that his words would be found one day and that his story would be known to the world. Ultimately it worked because the fellow prisoner who knew the secret survived the war and after their country was liberated he informed the authorities about the existence of this secret diary behind the ventilation grill in the prison cell. This is the Dutch translation of Peter Moon's diary from 1952. I consulted it recently in the wonderfully silent reading room of the Royal Library of Belgium. I think there is hardly a more raw and honest account of a man who is desperate and full of fear. However, this book is the proof that through his resilience and perseverance, he ultimately could claim victory over the people who wanted to silence him. Before resuming this video, if you like this content, then feel free to join the Bold Books and Bones community by subscribing to this channel. Now, back to the book called The Madman's Library. What I found intriguing is that the author, Edward Brooke Hitching, points out that each of the writings that he includes in his book redefines in its own way the concept of what a book can be. That is such a thoughtful insight. And he shows many fascinating examples. There are, for example, books that kill, books that are worn into battle, books that predict the future, alchemist books, books that are bound in human skin, books that are literary hoaxes, and so forth. I was particularly attracted by the Tibetan Buddhist prayer wheel that the author talks about. Hundreds of written prayers are rolled around the central spindle in a metal case. Buddhists from Tibet or Nepal would turn the wheel 
while reciting mantras and in this way unlock the power of these sacred words. And notice how through the intensive use of the prayer wheel by its previous owners, a brownish border has emerged on top of the paper scroll. So this instrument makes that words are awakened through motion and contemplation. I like that idea. I very much enjoyed reading the book by Edward Brooke Hitching. The many examples that he gives are eye-opening in the sense that they illustrate what we humans can do with written words. And I'm impressed by the extensive research done by the author. So if you're passionate about books and you want to learn about the strange and unusual, then this book is definitely for you. Now, in the chapter called Cryptic Books, he points us to one of the rarest books on this earth. And this book still holds its secret. It is called the Voynich Manuscript. I have here a beautiful made facsimile edition of this manuscript published by the Yale University. The manuscript is called after one of its owners, Mr. Wilfried Michael Voynich, a man who, to say the least, had a rather adventurous life. If the descriptions about this man by the people who knew him are correct, then he had a bit of an eccentric personality. Now, back to the mysterious book that Mr. Voynich owned. If we look at the elegant written text, then unfortunately we can't read it, because it is written in an unknown script, or maybe it is written in code. At this moment, we don't know which of these two it is. Or maybe it is none of those, but just a literary hoax. So, it was either created by someone who wanted to make a profit from it, or it is a text that holds some truth that hasn't been discovered yet. It would be too quick to conclude that it is definitely a hoax, if we consider what scholars have found out about this manuscript during the last decades. first question we could ask is if maybe Wilfred Voynich created the text. Let's assume that he created this mysterious manuscript so he could ask a lot of money for it. And we know that he valued it at $100,000, which was then and now a lot of money for a book. We know that Wilfred Voynich lived between 1865 and 1930. The manuscript, however, is much older than Mr. Voynich. We know this because the researchers from the Yale University have conducted a carbon-14 or radiocarbon dating test. And the results show that the parchment can be dated with 95% accuracy to a period between 1404 and 1438. So it is quite certain that at least the parchment is from the medieval period. A next question we could ask is if maybe Mr. Voynich or somebody else just used old parchments to make the hoax more believable. Also, this is not the case. There are at least two important indications that this text is very old. A first thing that scholars from Yale University confirmed is that the way the drawings look is consistent in style with what one would expect from drawings made in the 15th century. But an even more convincing indication that this is an old text is that we have a quite good view on who owned the manuscript throughout the centuries. About the first 150 years, we don't know much. But then we know that the manuscript was for several decades in Prague, the current Czech Republic. We know that it was owned by several people. And in 1666, the famous Jesuit Anastasius Kircher had the manuscript. We know this because a letter from a man called Johannes Marcy that was sent to Anastasius Kircher. In that letter, 
that still exists and that sits in the famous Beinecke library, the manuscript is clearly mentioned. The next thing we learn from this book is that the manuscript stayed in Rome for several hundreds of years until Voynich purchased it in 1912. He brought it with him to New York and tried to sell it in his antiquarian book business in Manhattan, but without success. After his death in 1930, the manuscript would change owners a few times more until it was donated to the University of Yale. So the good news is that it is definitely an old text. However, can we be sure that it is not a hoax? Personally, I hope it is not a hoax. However, since we cannot read the text, many people therefore turned to the fascinating drawings in the manuscript to see if these would give some clues about the meaning of the text. There are different categories of drawings. For example, there are those depicting all sorts of plants. There are drawings of what looks like astronomical diagrams. We see clearly drawings of zodiac signs and, strangely enough, a whole bunch of drawings depicting women who are bathing in a greenish substance. The plants haven't been identified so far and none of the other drawings have given clear clues that would help to understand the meaning or the purpose of the text. So, Unfortunately, we learned from this book that was edited by Raymond Clement that the images don't bring us any further at this point. What I learned from reading this informative book is that the scientific research at this point is far from conclusive. However, it is fascinating how extensively this manuscript has been studied and continue to be studied. Also, many people outside of the scientific community have made attempts to reveal the secrets of this intriguing text, which I find absolutely great, because it would not be the first time that a so-called amateur researcher discovers extraordinary things. That is why this facsimile edition is helpful to anyone who wants to give it a try. I found this a great edition by the Yale University and it's wonderful that they make the manuscript so easily accessible to everyone. Now I would love to share with you one more book that still holds quite some secrets. It is called The Book of Miracles and was recently rediscovered in Augsburg in Germany. I have here this beautiful facsimile edition published by Taschen. This book is an expression of an age-old concern and fascination of us humans with signs, omens and prophecies. We find plenty of examples of the importance of such phenomena in writings from classical antiquity and we find, of course, many examples of the description of such phenomena and of their meaning in the Bible. Maybe the most well-known text in this regard is the book of Revelation or the Apocalypse. And the book of Miracles contains, of course, several drawings about the Apocalypse. Here you see an example of it. It is the image of the famous four horsemen. Now what I find intriguing is that the signs, omens and prophecies in this manuscript are to a large extent not taken from the Bible. Some of them can be quite clearly traced back to other writings. For example, this drawing, which shows the omen of a fiery sword in the sky was most probably derived from a text by Flavius Josephus, who lived in the first century AD. And then there is this interesting mixture of images that show, on the one hand, episodes derived from legends, but on the other hand, there are quite a number of potentially natural observations. Because we find in this manuscript about 26 different drawings of 
comets and other celestial phenomena that people report to have seen in those days. If you are familiar with Taschen books, then you know that Taschen provides a companion book with their facsimile editions. I found these companion books essential when purchasing such an edition of an old manuscript, because they provide context and valuable information and the companion book is written by scholars. This is especially important for this manuscript that does not contain an introduction, that has no list of content and no dedication. This adds to the mystery surrounding these images, however this missing information makes it hard for us, the people of the 21st century, to understand their meaning. The companion book is therefore a great resource for people who want to engage with the content, the history and what we know about the makers of this remarkable manuscript. I particularly like the overview of possible sources for the drawings. Some of the drawings are inspired by drawings from the Luther Bible, more specifically the version of 1545 and the Chronicle by Sebastian Frank, which was published in 1531. However, the authors also indicate that the famous Chronicle of the World by Hartmann Schädel from 1493 was a possible source. Here we see, for example, in the Chronicle, a scene where snow falling from the sky changed to blood which supposedly happened in the southeast of Austria in the year 1226. We find the same scene also in the Book of Miracles. Here are a few other things that I learned from the companion book. The authors Till Holger Borchert and Joshua Waterman explain that other similar works existed long before this edition was published and that there were also similar editions from around the same time. One example is the Wikiana, that is now at the Zentralbibliothek in Zürich, Switzerland. Here are some images from the digitized version of the Wikiana that the Zentralbibliothek generously made available online. These other versions contain sometimes images that are similar to the Book of Miracles and can therefore be important references to learn more about the meaning of what is shown in the manuscript. The authors also inform us that the Book of Miracles was created around 1552, and that was of course a time where in the West the Catholic Church was fundamentally challenged by a Protestant Reformation movement. One of the prominent leaders of this movement was of course Martin Luther, he and many others openly questioned the papal authority and vented their anger about what they perceived as errors and abuses by the papal court. So imagine that you live in a time where for generations there had been one religion, one interpretation of the Bible, one version of the world and of the afterlife and suddenly this perceived eternal truth is under attack not only intellectually by writings of scholars from both sides that argue back and forth, but also by physical wars between followers of the old belief and followers of the new belief. So no wonder that in such unstable and confusing times, some people tried to make sense of what was happening by looking for signs, omens and prophecies. I truly enjoyed this wonderful publication and I found it fascinating that one or more of our human ancestors wanted to record and to preserve these messages or omens or prophecies for us, the future generations. While making this episode I was astonished to learn that so many books out there still hold secrets. I hope that you liked this episode of Bold Books and Bones and I also hope to see you in the next episode. In the meantime, please stay curious and stay free. Bye for now.